Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. It, it's not really a disconnect. Uh, you know, like I, I, I talked to him uh, on the play we got sacked on. It was first in possession. I talked to him before that. I said, Clint, we got to run the ball here. And he was going to run it on second down, thinking that he had a good play on first down. And then, you know, then it's on second down, it's second and 20. And so a lot of things like that happen. Uh, sometimes he doesn't hear me when he's calling a play in because you push the button and he, he can't hear me. He can only hear what he's saying. So there's some things like that that go on throughout the course of the game. Are That's you great. kidding? Are, are you serious, <laughs> dude? What? Yeah, you can't hear him. Go all the time. away, dude. Buttons are being pushed. People are talking. <laughs> There's o- orders up for Come French on. fries online one, hamburgers online it's, two, uh, play the calls crowd, online three. It's great. tough, man. Yeah, sometimes, you know. like, you know, my assistant who carries my cords and follows me around, sometimes he'll step yeah. on the cord and it causes a short. And so I'll, I'll miss a couple words and I'll have to elbow him and say, hey, Fred, get off get yeah. off the cord. I can't, I can't Why hear. Mike just come out and say the truth. I hate offense. <laughs> dude, I like, hate freaking offense. Dude, did you ever God, you see these these clips of like, you know, Tom Brady with Josh McDaniels back when he was with the Patriots or Sean McVay talking with Matthew Stafford or you know whoever and it's these high-level intellectual discussions about offense. And you get this guy, Mike Zimmer and his Basically, like his intern offensive coordinator, who was the wide receivers coach <laughs> at Kansas five years ago, and uh, yeah, I told him we need to run the ball. But then he said he had a play call for a first down, and we're going to run the ball on second down. Oh. And then uh, there was some feedback in my headphones, and I I lost how many communication. Times, how many times can you go back to that well, too? Like, like this has been a reoccurring theme of the Zim Show for like four or five years now. The run the ball theme. How long can you go back till somebody finally says, Mike, if that's what you want, um, that's a game plan thing. Like, like that's not a sudden. Hey, that should never be a sudden. Hey, in-game. Clint, Clint, can you hear me? Run, what, Is this thing on? Somebody. We got somebody. Clint's like, Mike, hello, Mike. Power. Power up the middle. Power. Mike, is that you? Dude, he's like, he he is. We've all had bosses in our lives that, you know, they'll like, they're not paying any attention to the details and they'll just drive by or whatever and be like, uh, why, 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 you guys should do this. And we're like, uh, we've been planning this with, with like, maybe you should drop in but, on a meeting once in a while. Like Zimmer is just like avoiding offensive discussions and meetings throughout the week. And he's just pissed off and driving by in the third quarter and being like, Hey, Hey, let's run the ball. Here's run the ball. Lead. Clint's like, I don't know. Can you even name one of our offensive play calls, Mike, which run play should we call? Say the name of the play. Let's see. Let's quiz you. Mike Mike's longstanding ability though to um to throw his OCs under the post game bus is really impressive. And, and the thing about this one that's incredible is like this guy's a kid. He's a kid. Clint Kubiak's a kid. And and Mike is acting like I mean this is the this is the DeFilippo show 2.0. It's the same act. I told him to run the ball more. We got to run the ball more. And, and he, he was asked specifically about that yesterday and said, well, um, we, we ran the ball, I, I think, a total of like 12 times and threw it like 40. Yeah, because you then, were down 20 to nothing and, after five minutes. But that is explanation. Guy. But but then, and this is what I love about Mike, the honest part of, of Mike. I, I just wish that we got this in its totality more. Mike says, Mike says what we all, what we all basically have said. He comes out and says, our two best players are Dalvin and Justin. All due respect to Mannion, but we have to use our two best players more <laughs> in a game. Dude, he it is, is hilarious, though. Uh, this is actually a good segue here to some Mackie and Judd, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment Therapy, uh, whatever you need us for. And uh, every Tuesday, we go through who gets it, who doesn't. I'm going to start us off here with a who gets it. Kalen Kaler from Defector.com. So Defector.com, I believe, is the spinoff, the guys who left Deadspin at the end of that. I mean, Deadspin's still around, but like the original version of Deadspin. I believe some of those writers spun off Defector.com. I'm like 80% Mm -hmm. sure on that. A lot of the guys are, a lot of the old writers at least are there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
And uh, the title of this article is just how big of a problem is nepotism in NFL coaching. And the first like thousand words are two anonymous sources within the Vikings organization ripping Mike Zimmer and the organization for for nepotism, mostly for Adam Zimmer having a defensive coordinator title. But Clint Kubiak also is a subject here. So I'm just going to read you some of this. Feel free to stop me. This is really interesting, but it's shining a light on, I think, one of the biggest problems with the Vikings. I mean, listen, we're wrong a lot on this show, as you find out every Wednesday with Write That Down and the Accountability Session. But one thing we talked about last summer, even going back to, you know, like the draft time, are you sure you want to run this thing back with a 34-year-old inexperienced offensive coordinator? who was the wide receivers coach at Kansas five years ago. Is that really like in a win now season, you got a veteran quarterback coach on the hot seat. It's time to go time to make a Super Bowl run. And you're going to experiment with Gary Kubiak's kid, right? Right. So here's the article. When George Edwards previous defensive coordinators contract ran out after 2019, Mike Zimmer had a job to fill in an unusual move. He promoted two internal candidates to share the role as co-defensive coordinators. One was 59-year-old Andre Patterson with 16 years of experience as an NFL defensive line coach, which he's excellent at, and another 21 years in high school and college football as a head coach, defensive coordinator, and assistant coach. Mm -hmm. The other candidate was Adam Zimmer. Mike's 36-year-old son with six years experience as an NFL position coach and eight years as an NFL assistant. Quote from someone in the organization. No effing reason Adam should be a defensive coordinator. Nobody disliked him. Nobody ever thought he would be the coordinator. Let's put it that way. Everybody knows why Adam is there. They all know. What's the term? Nepotism, right? Big Zim promoted Little Zim. Mm -hmm. That's from someone close to the situation. So that one now now let's break these down too, Phil, a, a little bit because I think the D the DC promotions and the OC are very different and worth discussing. Um, I think the angst about Adam being promoted, rightfully so, was was the the title because Patterson deserves like he he, he goes back to his first stint as a Viking assistant was with Denny in the late nineties. Yeah, John um, Randall, Chris Dolman. Yeah, but but. But if we're going to be honest about this, he could have promoted you to to D- DC. Like like he doesn't he doesn't per, he permits Adam to do things when it doesn't matter. He's basically a gopher. And Patterson uh, has a voice and is a very good defensive line coach. But nobody other than Mike is DC. But so some I of think, it's some of it's perception though. That's what I'm saying. I think the angst there is the perception. And Patterson just flat out deserved the title. But make no mistake, it's a title. So in that case, in that case, Mike is sending a bad message. Uh, but everything that's wrong with this defense is on Mike and so always I, has been. Or the there, good is on Mike, too. There's a second source here, and it's a former player who played for the Vikings. So I'll read you a couple more sentences here. Patterson had been coaching football since 1982 and coaching in the NFL since 1997. He'd never been named defensive coordinator in the league. Patterson's own son is also on the Viking staff as an assistant running backs coach, so he isn't one to throw stones in a glass stadium. But the for, but uh, a former Vikings player described Andre Patterson's promotion alongside the much less experienced Adam. Let's promote both of you guys, even right. though one of you's been in the league for 25 years. Right. Uh, this former player characterized it as a slap in the face. So Mike Zimmer calls defensive plays during games, but allows Adam to call plays during practice. Right. It's some cute bleep so he can feel some type of way, the former player said about Adam. Patterson, a powerful speaker, is the one who addresses the defense and at times the full team. This past April, Patterson was promoted again, this time adding assistant head coach to his co-defensive coordinator title, probably to make him feel better, a second source close to the team said. Um 
You have to achieve at such a high level, and you look at Andre Patterson. He's performed at a high level every time, and he can't get a sniff, and Adam just had to stick around. They aren't even in the same weight class, yet they have the same yeah. title, end quote, from a source. Right, right. But This is like when we talk about this team having some weird juju and the chemistry feels off and it just feels like you know a bunch of dudes clocking in, clocking out. This is a small thing, but this is the type of thing that gets people – just like worked up and pissed off behind the scenes about the head coach. Well, and, and, you know, I'm sure Andre Patterson was very pleased and didn't care about sharing the title because his kid got a job too. That's the problem here. Everybody got a job. Your kid gets a job. Your kid, it's, it's basically an an Oprah episode. You get a job, you get a job too. Hey, you're going to get a job. So, so, and if I'm the old man and my kid's going, going, to, to get a job and I have to share a title with a kid to do that. Um, I'm with you to me, this one all about perception, all about perception. Yeah. Like but if, I mean, you're, if you're in that locker room, it's not worse be, because those two do, do their small job. And Mike is, Mike is the guy when the defense is going well, Zimmer's a genius. And when it's not, it's on Mike. Well, the defense might not be worse because ultimately, yeah, Mike's like those are he, Mike Zimmer's delegating some of the details through the through the week. Like, go look at this piece of film. But Mike Zimmer's calling the plays and stuff. Correct. during the game. So I get that. But it probably throws the chemistry of the team off if multiple sure. players and there's people quoted in this article that maybe maybe you're from like a it says former player. So it's probably not someone on the 2021 team unless it's Bashad Breland. But somebody in the locker room thinks. Boy, Andre Patterson's getting a raw deal here. Why is this like? I don't hate Adam Zimmer, but who the hell is this guy? Right. Like, why? Why am I listening to him? Right. And then, and then, and then, guys start to bitch about it behind the scenes, and you can see how it would erode culture. Clint Kubiak, I think, is actively making the offense worse because That's, he is an unqualified exa- offensive coordinator exactly. on a team that needs someone to be the head coach of the offense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The Kubiak one is is a stupid move. The the. Zimmer Patterson Patterson's kid one is a question is a questionable move that that I think people look at and they're they're like really um the Kubiak one is a flat out dumb stupid somebody should have stopped it move like like there's no question about it there's no question about it um we questioned it but even we didn't come close to say and this is going to be a train i mean this is a train wreck and i don't care what the offensive stats say don't give give me a break well they're 17th in uh in epa which is sort of an all-encompassing offensive efficiency stat and they're 16th in yards per play yeah and they're 14th in scoring so they're like they're not a top 10 offense they should be mike mike is in my opinion mike went a long way towards signing his his uh minnesota vikings coaching death certificate with that move like whoever allowed that the zimmer thing it's like okay your kid that's not smart but we all know that you're a complete control freak on defense uh the offensive one to me just sends i mean there's nothing good about it there's nothing there's no saving it you know again mike is mike is treating and here here's the thing that, that is scary about it mike is treating clint like a real a real oc like he's he's telling him the same crap that he did, you know. Got to run more. Got to do this. It's like Mike. Do you realize this kid is drowning? He's drown. He can't do this. I mean, they're literally like the, the, the first seven or eight games of the season. The TV broadcast crews, almost all of them, week by week, would talk about how Clint's just getting used to the flow of play calling for the first time, and you know, trying to slow things down as a play caller. It's like. That's what we're talking about here in a season in which the expectations are high. Really? No, I think I think Zimmer had it right many years with many different guys where he would bring in a former head coach, an experienced, established coordinator, Pat Shermer, Norv Turner, Gary Kubiak. I mean, Kevin Stefanski wound up becoming a head coach, but he said with all almost all those guys, right, it was you are the head coach of the offense, basically. So just keep me in the loop. I definitely want us to run the ball a lot, so just know that. And uh, each one of them departed quickly for different reasons. I mean, North Turner was a weird falling out. We still don't know that full story. Right. He just, like, they had, I, I don't know if they've talked since. There was some friction there. Uh, Gary Kubiak was maybe on the verge of retiring anyways, but we don't know that whole story either. Pat Shermer got a head coaching job, so can't blame him for that. 
the Gary one is really weird too, Phil, because I feel like so so Mike, rightfully so, didn't trust Stefanski fully at that time, and, and it's like he got his buddy to come in, but his buddy said, "If I do this, Mike, I'll do you the solid here. My kid has to replace me," um, because if you're Rick Spielman or hell the Wilfs, wouldn't you have have looked at the at the flip? Um, hiring and subsequent firing. And, and I, I mean, John was a young guy who had far more experience than Clint did. Um, but that was the moment that I said offensively, unless there's a buffer like a Gary Kubiak, you this guy probably can't work with young minds when it comes to offense because he outsources it almost completely. Mm-hmm. So Stefanski's a pleasant surprise, but Stefanski had a buffer too. So who didn't say... To your point again, going into a, you know, no excuses, huge expectations year, who didn't say, okay, I understand, Mike, that you promised Gary some things. Uh, but that being said, like, this is ripe not to work. Well, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, you talk about a buffer. It'd be nice if you had a veteran quarterback leader who could act as that buffer between the head coach and the coordinator and help collaborate and get involved in game planning. But he just works here. It's maddening. All right, who gets it? Who doesn't? So, so stupid. Dex, go ahead. Sure, I'll go ahead. I'll go with who doesn't get it. <clears throat> and uh, this is a little rehash from Judd and I's conversation on our comments edition on the Purple Daily channel from yesterday. Because uh, I saw a lot of these comments, and this is why we led with the episode with it, but I think it's worth bringing it up again to this show, and it's calling Kellen Mond a bust. Um, without even rehashing what Mike's... Zimmer had to say, which was a very unfair and an unwarranted comment. I don't think it's fair to label a third round pick who's in his rookie season a bust. No, nor do I think it should be just a black and white approach when you're talking about a third round pick also being a bust. He was the 66th pick in the draft. So 65 guys in front of him were selected. And the odds of Mod even being a viable starting quarterback were against him, right? Like, I mean, he was going to be a project. He was obviously going to sit behind Kirk. There was going to be no solution where Mon was going to step in, most likely into 2021, and contribute. He had to develop it a little bit. Um, I just think we're so quick sometimes to label guys, bust, he's a bust, he's a bust. When, kind of look at the context of where that pick was made, who is selecting that player, like Laquan Treadwell, that's a bust. Garrett Bradbury, trending to being a bust. I mean, Treadwell, it, Treadwell's uh, having a nice little season for the Jaguars popping the up a little month bit. and a half. I'm just saying. Just popping saying. up a little bit. I think if you earn, like, I think the, the safest way to say you're not a bust is if, number one, if you're a first-round pick and you basically earn a second multi-year contract. Like, like Trey Waynes, I know, has been hurt for Cincinnati, but, like, Trey Waynes was a nice, serviceable cornerback for the Vikings. He earned a second contract with Cincinnati. That was a multi-year deal. Like, I think we're just sometimes so quick to say he's a bust and he's a quarterback, so he was supposed to help out and he was supposed to contribute. Well, hold on here. Look at the context of, wh- of where the pick was made. Let's not just run and jump that he's a bust, even if he's going to look a little horrendous in his first rookie season being the scout team quarterback. Well, I th- yeah, I think for a third-round pick quarterback, the bar for whether he pans out or not is really like, can he become a viable backup quarterback? Because there's mm-hmm. there's not that many guys third round and later that become multi-year starting quarterbacks. And so I think the hope, like the bare, the bare minimum hope for Kellen Mond would be, can he be the Vikings' backup quarterback for like, five or eight mm-hmm. years or something that would be amazing if he was like a five or eight year backup quarterback with the upside to maybe start if if he right. fully develops but there's no way he's going to fully develop under the current vikings infrastructure which i don't think is going to be around in a week from now anyways but then then you know, you, you look at all these people are sending screenshots uh, of kellen mond liking tweets that show how crappy zimmer's comments were after the game i mean you know, people are tweeting like, you know, boy, Zimmer, this is one of the like most cold, callous things anyone's ever said about a player. And like Kellen is liking those posts on social media. So he sees that his head coach is a buffoon who doesn't know offense and who flies off the handle at a postgame press conference. You just kind of hope that he sees it and it hasn't derailed his chances to to become a viable NFL player. But we'll see. All right. Who does not get it? I, I am going to stick with the football theme and stick with quarterbacks. But in this particular case, this quarterback is now a, a very notable analyst in college football. And this occurred on Saturday. 
Kirk Herbstreet. Did did you guys hear the comment Dude, um, d- during the? Disaster. Oh, and but I mean, it really was because it was so it was so self serving and stupid. D- during the um, bowl pregame shows on on New Year's Day, Kirk Herbstreet and to a certain degree, Phil Mackey's favorite guy, Desmond Howard, had a conversation about players now not playing in bowl games and they don't love the game like we did and they are pulling out of these games and and the passion is lacking like we had it and then so so one one they never broached the subject of coaches brian kelly who happened to just leave their schools brian kelly skipped out on the whatever bowl game that was right and and that's what coaches and that's what coaches do um and then in i believe it was the final bowl game of the day, Ole Miss quarterback Matt Corral, who's expected to be a fairly high draft pick, gets hurt. Now, I believe it, it was a sprained ankle, but at the time it looked bad. And, and of course, he had he had doubled down and I guess good for him had said, I could sit out this game, but I'm not going to. I love my team. I love my sport. So like he did everything that Kirk Herbstreet wants and he got hurt. Yeah. And and so but I mean this comment without weighing both sides and what coaches do and I would I don't blame any player unless they were to pull out of a bowl game that had national title implications. I don't blame any kid who says, "You know what? It's been a great run. I'm done now." Um but these comments to me were so basically um ESPN puts on a ton of bowl games. They own them. We like to show the best players available when guys sit out, we can't. And therefore, I love the game and they don't. That is, also, a don't get it. They're not getting a, I get that they're getting scholarships, but, you know, that's kind of the bare minimum. This is, this is a multi billion dollar right. professional sport, basically. It's a multi billion dollar sport. And uh, these bowl games are just like the biggest cash grabs ever because the title of the sponsor is literally baked into the name of the bowl and it's all over the field and stuff. It's it's all about capitalism and sponsorship money, and that's fine. But these players aren't getting paid by that entity. Now, they can make money, name image likeness money, so it's a little different now in that like maybe it does make sense to flash in a bowl game so that you can – get an extra $500,000 on a shoe deal or something, but that's a personal decision. You're not being paid by your school or by the NCAA to play in that game. And so if you've built up enough credibility to be a number one draft pick or a first or second round pick and make life-changing money, why would you risk giving that up? Why would you risk falling, you know, due to an ACL tear from like the third overall pick to a third round guy and lose out on millions of dollars? And and those bowl games... To be clear, outside of the playoff games, mean nothing. Mm -hmm. They are glorified exhibition games that are cash grabs. But you could even argue that the the playoff games are, like, it's all, you know, how far do you want to take this? Like, the playoff games are also this massive... But I would like to win, but if you give me a chance to to win a legitimate championship, but, but I mean, this is, the rest of those games are literally NFL preseason games. Like, Mm -hmm. there's nothing at stake. Playing makes no sense. And for him to, to say, like, well, these guys, they don't love the sport. I mean, if I have a chance to be drafted, I'm not going to play in a preseason yeah. exhibition like, type of game. Like if I tell you, all right, so you, through the last four or five years, you have played so well and you've built up such a great resume and enough credibility to where we think you're going to be a top 10 or 15 draft pick and you're instantly going to get 10 to 20 million dollars guaranteed life-changing money over the course of the next five years but if you play in this game there's like a five percent chance you could tear your acl and maybe fall out of the first round and you'll still get drafted and you'll still have a chance to play in the nfl but you know maybe you're not the same player when you come back and it might it might cut millions and do- millions and millions of dollars off your earnings but if you get if, if you take you know you play in that game and there's a 95 percent chance you don't get hurt you could hoist the fiesta bowl mvp right like right, right. who cares <laughs> exactly <laughs> i side with players make your own decision would i play probably i don't know like if i love the game i you could be a first play, but... or second round pick i for sure would advise you not to play and that's fine as, as your agent advisor, you can as your agent i would tell you you're not playing in that game <laughs> Because we're going to make more money in the NFL, baby. Uh, who doesn't get it? 
This is probably the seventh time I've put this combination on my uh, who doesn't get it list. Major League Baseball and Rob Manfred. So uh, Ken Rosenthal, who's one of the, the great sports journalists in this country, just likable, credible. He's one of the best insiders in sports in America. And he works for The Athletic, he works for Fox, and he works for MLB Network or worked for MLB Network. They fired him yesterday because of multiple critical pieces he has wrote over the last couple of years about Rob Manfred and various uh, situations that he has mishandled. And so you've got, again, this is like there's a whole conversation here about state run sports media. Vikings.com and MLB.com. It's like, yeah, like I'm not saying there's not valuable content that's entertaining or whatnot that come out of these state run sports platforms. Mm -hmm. But the minute that someone is critical at all, and Ken Rosenthal is not just like slinging personal attacks, like Ken Rosenthal is a great sports journalist. Boom, canned. No longer can you find Ken Rosenthal on MLB Network. And I just think that's ridiculous. So. Yay, third-party journalism. Yay, objectivity. And yay, holding people accountable. Boo, state-run sports media. Well, but I mean, baseball, too. It, this, is a, this is a pending disaster. This is a, I mean, this league still is locked out, and I know, I, I know it's, it's January, and I know that, you know, spring tr training wouldn't start for, what, a month and, a month and change. But... This is a pen, this is a pending disaster because this means that Rob Manfred is actually involved in the firing of a guy who's been critical. And by the way, I went back and looked, and it's not like he didn't torch him. He he basically questioned things. And so what we're talking about is a commissioner, and this is what I keep saying. He is bracing us, and he is trying to get ahead of a work stoppage that's going to go on for months. Like he wants, he wants people out who question it because it's going to get worse, not better. Of course, it's ridiculous because Ken Rosenthal is going to have a lot more people watching his work on Fox, Fox Sports One, and Absolutely. reading in the Athletic than you know the five people that watch MLB Network this, during the winter. So I don't know about Dex. This reminds this reminds me more and more of the path that that hockey went down in two thousand four or five, and they lost an mm -hmm. entire season. Like this reminds but me, but we of a, gained shootout, so maybe we'll get a exactly. home run derby after yeah, each time. That's, that's what they're saying, Phil. I, I guarantee you, I, and I guarantee you, privately, they are looking at what hockey did and the good that came from that. And make no mistake, hockey broke the players. There's an escrow tax now. They can literally go to this day if they don't play enough games, they withhold salary. I'm just saying this is uh that the what you just said as a don't get it is completely true and I'm on board but I think that there's a bigger story here off of things like this that if you're a baseball fan is so concerning. Ken Rosenthal should just switch to the NFL or the NBA. Just become an insider for a He's too small for basketball. He couldn't. I mean, I, hey, what's up, Shaq? What's going on? Yeah. Uh D D Dex, do you want to hit us with one more or should we get to the yeah. cuz I know you had one that we were going to shove into oh, yeah. a different thing. Go I'll, ahead. I'll I'll say who quickly who gets it as we were talking off mic. Uh Netflix programming for bringing back two absolute classic staples that they have. Number 1, Cobra Kai which yes. launched on New Year's Eve, which I, I so haven't got good. into, but that's going to be my Tuesday evening plans. Is a lot of Cobra Kai tonight. Uh, and also Queer Eye, the latest season of Queer Eye in Austin, Texas. If Don't you have not you've discovered Queer it's Eye, it's a great show. Like all right, Karama will tear down your walls and make you cry and make you feel like a, a bad person. Jonathan is just, if, if, you, if you don't like uplifting people, there's something wrong with you. And I'll say this, Bobby gets the least amount of credit. This dude, Bobby, is remodeling an entire home, ripping out drywall, and yeah, like Karamo's is making seconds. you cry. Yeah, yeah, like and and like I, all of them are very important and integral to the part of the show. But I'll say my guy Bobby does not get enough credit. He's out here remodeling an entire home, and Anthony's like cooking up marinated chicken. Okay, like on, it's, it's on, on on Cobra Kai. I haven't seen season four. I think I think it's season four that came out. Yeah, right? it's four. Mm -hmm. But they brought back, I saw one of the promos, so Karate Kid Part 3, where yeah. he gets duped. It's weird because, like, the timing doesn't make sense. He, like, has already graduated high school, I feel like, and then he like, goes back to the All-Valley tournament because he runs into this uh, ponytailed sensei guy, evil ponytailed sensei guy. Do you guys remember this at all from Karate no, Kid 3? Or no, no, I don't even know. It's been so long since I've seen okay. Part 3. 
So he's fully gray now. I don't know that he's even been in any movies in the last like 15 years. I'll go check his IMDb. But like that guy comes back for season four. I know it means nothing to you guys because you no. apparently haven't seen Karate Kid. Part and is three, that but... good or is that a mistake? I think it's a mistake. I don't know. Okay, that I, was he, I, think he, I don't think he was a good character. Going down here. I, I'm yeah. more invested in like all the like the actual kids. So like I like Tori a lot. I like uh, I, I like I like Johnny's uh, Johnny's kid. I like I like all of, of the kids that are involved. So I'll see how this vi- like you know the new villain is added with Crease. But I, I I'm excited Allie to watch season I. four. If she's on, I'll watch. She was on in season. She was three. on. I know she was. I yeah, saw season it. three. I saw yeah, the yeah. part. Yeah, she's played a she's great. integral role. So, all right, there it is. Who gets it? Who doesn't? Every week on Mackie and Judd, uh, daily Minnesota sports entertainment.